The mere fact that both IHL and human rights law apply in armed conflict does not necessarily mean that there will inevitably be conflict. For example, on some issues, like the protection of persons in non-international armed conflict, IHL contains only a few general rules, while human rights law contains a greater number of more specific rules. More generally, even when a different solution seems to be provided on a similar issue by IHL and human rights law, in practice, judicial and other bodies made a conscious effort to reconcile these two branches of international law. How? By interpreting provisions of one branch of law in light of the other, or in other words, by cross-interpretations. This suggests that when conflict seems to exist between IHL and human rights law, there are only apparent conflicts. However, even in cases of genuine conflict, attempts are made to reconcile the two branches of law. We will see that later, when analyzing the case law of the European Court of Human Rights on the issue of administrative detention. So the processes of interaction between the two legal regimes can be described into opposite movement. The first is what may be called the humanitarization of human rights. This refers to the ways in which human rights are interpreted by reference to IHL. The opposite movement is the humanization of IHL. This refers to the gradual ways in which IHL rules have been interpreted by reference to the principles and concepts of human rights law. Let's start with the humanitarization of human rights law. The most well-known and most quoted example of such a humanitarization is contained in paragraph 24 of the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. Let's read it together. The court observes that the protection of the international covenant of civil and political rights does not cease in times of war, except by operation of Article 4 of the Covenant, whereby certain provisions may be derogated from in a time of national emergency. Respect for the right to life is not, however, such a provision. In principle, the right not arbitrarily to be deprived of one's life applies also in hostilities. The test of what is an arbitrary deprivation of life, however, then falls to be determined by the applicable lex specialis, namely the law applicable in armed conflict, which is designed to regulate the conduct of hostilities. Thus, whether a particular loss of life through the use of a certain weapon in warfare is to be considered an arbitrary deprivation of life, contrary to Article 6 of the Covenant, can only be decided by reference to the law applicable in armed conflict and not deduced from the terms of the covenant itself. So what can be, what can be inferred from such a paragraph? First, that it's clear for the court that human rights law, in particular, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, also applies in armed conflict unless derogation has been submitted and accepted. But the right to life cannot be derogated, even in emergency situations such as armed conflicts. Second, the court used the Lex Specialis principle to conciliate IHL and human rights law. That principle is one of the law mechanisms provided under international law for resolving conflicts of rules. According to the Lex Specialis principle, the rule, which is more specific to the situation at stake, prevails over the more general rule. In our field, 
this would normally mean that IHL would prevail over human rights law. There are other mechanisms, such as Article 103 of the United Nations Charter, according to which UN law prevails over other norms. But IHL can only be considered UN law in extremely limited circumstances. Or there is also the very general legal principle of lex posterior, whereby the more recently created rules how to prevail over all the norms. But again, the application of this rule can be controversial when the rules in question belong to different bodies of law, as is the case with IHL and human rights law. Third, the International Court of Justice did not use the Lex Specialis principle in its traditional meaning as a true mechanism for resolving conflicts of norm. The principle of Lex Specialis has not been used to set aside the right to life provided under human rights law in favor of the, of the right to use lethal force provided under IHL. Instead, the principle of Lex Specialis has been used in order to establish the legal context in which human rights law must be interpreted. In other words, the right to life under human rights law has to be interpreted in light of IHL. This means that such a right will not be violated if the killing of a person in an armed conflict conforms to the relevant IHL norms. For example, because that person was a combatant. This is very different to saying that human rights are displaced by IHL and do not apply. Thus, the Lex Specialis principle allowed the core to give a conciliatory interpretation of the right to life, thus avoiding any conflict between the two bodies of law. This conciliatory approach has also been followed at the regional levels, sometimes based on the same particular use of the Lex Specialis principle or sometimes based on other mechanisms. Let's analyze that in the next developments before examining the opposite movement, the humanization of IHL.